Does it dirt? Hello, my ghost hunting friends, Arlo here, and today we're reviewing <gasps> Luigi's Mansion 3. We have been blessed with another sequel to the GameCube classic, but the big question is, is the game an absolute scream? Or will it make you say, boo? Like a boo. It's a good joke. Let's find out. What? What? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Luigi's Mansion 3 is a game I've been waiting an awfully long time for. Nearly 20 years, in fact. I played the original on my GameCube shortly after launch and absolutely loved it. And since then, the idea of it turning into a genuine series has been an exciting one. I was of course happy when Dark Moon was announced, and trust me when I say that it's a terrific game. In certain ways, it outclasses even the original. But the conversation surrounding Dark Moon always leads to a but, because despite what it brought to the table, it was fundamentally dragged down by its aggravating mission structure and complete lack of unique portrait ghosts. I will always consider the game an important and enjoyable one, and of course, it was the first actual Luigi's Mansion sequel, establishing the IP as a true continuing series. But I've been waiting for the real Luigi's Mansion sequel. The one that isn't designed differently because it's on a handheld. One with the open format of the first game. One that utilizes beautiful HD visuals. One that's allowed to be the epic experience I know Luigi's Mansion can be. Has that day finally come? It has indeed, my friends. Luigi's Mansion 3 is the sequel I've been waiting for. It's the pinnacle of Nintendo quality and I love it to pieces. Though it pains me to admit that it's held back way more than it should be by some disappointing design choices. One thing that really impresses me about Luigi's Mansion 3 is just how many new mechanics it brings to the series. It could have easily gotten away with just a couple new things. We would have all been ravenous to play it anyway. But no, Luigi's moveset has been majorly expanded. I would argue that the slam mechanic is the biggest new one because it drastically alters the core ghost catching gameplay. In the first game, all you had to do was keep sucking up a ghost until its health reached zero. Then Dark Moon had you filling up a meter and hitting A to create a sort of pulse or shock and take an extra big chunk off a ghost's health. In three, the pulse idea is taken a step further. After filling up your meter, you can then slam the ghost into the ground repeatedly. And I absolutely love this mechanic for multiple reasons. It adds even more action to the gameplay and gives you even more to do when sucking up ghosts. Instead of just damaging one ghost, it allows you to slam other ghosts and damage them as well. And narratively, it just makes so much more sense than a simple electrical pulse. It fits extremely well with the cartoony nature of the world. It does, unfortunately, introduce something of a problem, but I'll talk about that later. Next, we have the addition of the suction shot, which is also absolute genius. Once more, it fits so well with Luigi's other moves to the point where I'm surprised it hasn't always been a thing. You can use it against ghosts, and this is the only way to slam and stun some boss ghosts. You can also use it on the environment to either yank things open or slam and break containers. It's doubly genius because it ties in with the new slam mechanic and extends it beyond the boundaries of battle. Smashing stuff just feels terrific. And there's something very satisfying about trying to puzzle out a room and finally finding a spot where the little aim assist outline locks on, indicating that the suction shot will work on that surface. Now, Gooigi, I was slightly worried about. You can take turns between controlling Luigi and Gooigi, or you can grab a second player and play through most of the game co-op. When I learned about this, I was afraid that the game design would suffer because of it. I've played plenty of games where I felt like accommodating for co-op made the experience easier, simpler, more spread out, and somewhat lacking in exciting moments. And from the small amount of footage that I watched before launch, I also feared that Gooigi simply wouldn't be interesting enough. Gooigi can go through spikes, so when you find some spikes, Spikes, bring out Gooigi and go through them. Done. We. But I'm very happy to say that both of my fears turned out to be unfounded. The level design isn't hurt by Gooigi's presence, and in fact, it's all the more interesting because of him, as the game presents many situations where you need to make the two guys work together. Gooigi can fit into grates and pipes, which can take him any number of places, whether down into a crawl space or up onto a series of ledges. He can't touch water though, so Luigi often has to aid him in closing a faucet or something similar. And the best sequences are when you're switching between the two multiple times to solve a puzzle. And even even beyond traversal and puzzle solving, having a second Luigi also means just having a second Luigi. 
I'd love to elaborate on this more and talk about some of my favorite uses of Guiji, but I'm afraid I'd be getting into spoiler territory. Suffice it to say though, it's amazing to me that Guiji enables co-op play while not only not negatively impacting the game design, but actually lifting it up and enabling many other unique experiences as well. Finally, this fancy new Poltergust also has the Burst ability. Once again, I say that this is both a genius idea and one that improves upon a previous one by making it more narratively cohesive. Dark Moon introduced the ability to jump while fighting ghosts in order to avoid the attacks of other ghosts. This was certainly useful because having no way to suck up a ghost and simultaneously defend yourself was something of an annoyance in the first game. But why could Luigi only jump in battle? Why couldn't he jump anywhere else? He can jump in all the other games, so when you remind us of that fact, it becomes a little weird that he can't do it everywhere. That's where the burst comes in. The Poltergust lets out a burst of air that shoots Luigi upward, and this can be done basically at any time. All at once, this fixes the narrative issue and opens up some fun new possibilities. Now, anytime a ghost sends a shockwave or something similar your way, you can jump over it with the right timing. It can also temporarily knock back any ghosts surrounding you, which fixes another annoyance in the first game. You're completely surrounded and just need to clear a little space for yourself, so boom, you open up a hole. You can do even more with the burst ability, but once once more, I must leave some for potential newcomers to discover. I'd say the game controls decently well. Considering you're controlling a character's aim with a fixed third-person camera, rotating them tank-style, and frequently having them aim at things toward the screen, the two-stick system gets the job done. There is some awkwardness, though. When trying to fine-tune your aim, it can be a bit of a hassle constantly moving your thumb between the stick and face buttons. Two systems are in place here to aid you. First, you can tilt the controller to aim up or down, which does help to free up your fingers a bit. Second, L and R can also be used for a strobe bulb and suction shot, so you can potentially skip the face buttons altogether. For some reason though, it was hard for me to always remember to utilize every method at my disposal, so that little bit of awkwardness never went away entirely. Also, whenever using the vacuum function, strobe bulb, dark light, or suction shot, Luigi locks into a strafe, and I was very happy to discover that holding the B button gives him free movement again. Switching between the two modes is very useful. However, when using Joy-Cons, it's a little tricky for me to hit the X button and the B button at the same time, seeing as they're the top and bottom buttons. And in the case of using Using the dark light to reveal booze, accidentally hitting A and flashing them with the strobe bulb causes them to hide again. A little annoying. Overall though, despite the awkwardness, I still think the controls are fine. They mostly just take some getting used to. Okay, honestly, I don't know how I've gotten this far into the review without talking about how the game looks. Maybe I've been putting it off. Talking about the graphics and visual style in Luigi's Mansion 3 inevitably leads to what sounds like <laughs> annoying hyperbole. Because there are good looking games out there. And then there are games that look so good, they put all the other games to shame. I literally don't understand how this game can look so good. I mean, I do understand to an extent that games with smaller environments have more horsepower to work with. The bigger a game world is, and the more that has to be loaded at all times, the lower the raw graphical fidelity is going to be. Luigi's Mansion's environments are fairly small, and even when you find larger rooms, there's never too much going on at once. Okay, I get that, but I still don't get it. <laughs> the lighting is extraordinary, combining with expert shading and color work to create a world that's dripping with atmosphere. The way Luigi's flashlight plays over certain surfaces is an effect that looks like it would be at home in a PS4 game. The vistas surrounding the hotel are gorgeous and give the location a real sense of place in the world. Crystal clear reflections of Luigi will greet you in every mirror. And speaking of crystal clear, I cannot properly express how happy I am that the devs chose to prioritize resolution over frame rate. The game employs masterful anti-aliasing, and the result is a smooth look that is shockingly beautiful, especially in handheld mode. Luigi is so fluidly animated and expressive that the game frequently looks like a pre-rendered CG cutscene. Whenever I'm in the elevator and killing a few moments, I watch Luigi in awe as I make him run around, and I'm amazed that graphics have come so far since I was a kid. All of the character work is incredible. Are you like me, where you've got a number of little things on your personal Nintendo wish list, ideas and concepts you long for but never truly expect? 
because this game delivers something I long for, and it's surreal. Seeing Mario and Luigi and Peach leaving their abstract, floating ice cream worlds behind and living in a more real, consistent world is a delight. The whole intro sequence sets the stage perfectly because it displays an immense amount of personality and sets the standard for the rest of the game. Every single cutscene is so charming and animated so expertly, and it really is a dream come true for me. I mean, Egad still talks with the same weird little gibberish phrases, but this time they fully animated his mouth for each one. That is a detail that I hugely appreciate. Ah, but graphical fidelity and nice cutscenes aren't all you get. The visual style and terrific personality spill into the levels themselves and how they're designed and populated. If I have to use one word to describe this game's levels, it's dense. They're not huge, but they're jam-packed with stuff to interact with. And the devs threw in more funny little details than I can possibly count. Everywhere you go, you'll find little gaps and animations that only happen in that one spot and then they're done. It's so rare to see so much love and time going into a game like this, and it makes for a truly unreal experience. Luigi's vocalizations and reactions alone give the game such a wholesome, charming quality that I will adore for the rest of my furry blue Ouija loving days. And on the gameplay side, this denseness translates to an absolute bloat of treasure to find. Each floor has six gems, and these are hidden in some delightful and devious ways, making the hunt incredibly satisfying. Perhaps best of all, though, are the coins and bills and gold bars and pearls you'll find stuffed into every couch and garbage can and flower pot and toilet in the hotel. They've all been given their own physics and the number you find has been cranked up to 11. It's... It's such a silly thing to be so into, but man, collecting all this stuff just feels good. You'll find giant stacks of coins and suck up huge swirling clouds of bills. Money will just fall and spray and pour out of every place imaginable, and it never stops being fun to try and grab it all. And on top of the money, the levels are populated with huge numbers of freestanding items that also have their own physics. Most of these can be sucked up and destroyed with the poltergust, and again, there's just something immensely satisfying about the Process. It all just breaks and crumples and sucks right into the nozzle, sometimes spraying out even more objects as it does. The result of all this is that a tremendous amount of my playtime boils down to just <laughs> mashing that vacuum button and grinning as thousands of pounds of objects of all kinds get reduced to nothing and my money count soars. As you probably know, Luigi's Mansion 3 takes place in a hotel, and this proves to be an incredibly clever setting. Each floor has its own theme, and while the early floors are the kind you would expect to see in a hotel, the themes slowly become more interesting as the game goes on. The different floors manage to offer extravagant, visually spectacular, or otherwise just really interesting ideas while, with a few arguable exceptions, still working within the confines of that hotel concept. Each one has you capturing ghosts and solving light puzzles and hunting down keys. Some floors are fairly small or straightforward, but others offer up more open exploration. I'm always going on and on about variety, and I have zero complaints in that department. There are so many different styles and mechanics on display that almost every floor is a treasure in its own way. There are some sequences that straight up filled me with what I can only describe as childlike glee. When I first considered the hotel theme before the game's release, there was of course the worry that such a structure would be too linear. Hitting floor after floor after floor all the way to the top wouldn't be much better than Dark Moon's mission structure, right? Thankfully, this was another worry that was unfounded. Yes, your goal is to work your way to the top, and yes, you reach a point where you're mostly earning elevator buttons in a linear order, but there's still more than enough backtracking to offer a satisfying sense of freedom and exploration. You'll visit floors multiple times looking for booze and all the gems you might have missed. The first third or so of the game in particular has you getting buttons in a weird order and jumping around all over the place, and it's really fun. And sometimes EGAD will have a special assignment for you, or some other event will have Happen that will require you to visit previously explored floors. Some people might find this kind of padding to be annoying, because essentially it really kind of mostly sort of is padding. It's taking what you've developed and trying to squeeze a little more use out of it. In Dark Moon, this was done to a bit of an annoying degree. You would be forced to retread cleared sections over the course of multiple missions, and Polterpup would come along at the last second and steal your newly acquired key, predictably and with annoying frequency. 
but when I'm really enjoying a game, I think a little padding can be a great thing. Sometimes I beg for it even, in order to make the whole experience just a little longer and feel a little less like a strictly linear experience. And in the case of Luigi's Mansion 3, I feel like they've struck a great balance. The extra little missions are totally silly and borderline superfluous, but I always feel like they're just interesting enough to help break up the regular flow of gameplay. And one type of extra mission in the latter half of the game leads to some really cool encounters that were a highlight for me. Making a triumphant return from the first game is what we can now call character ghosts. They don't live in portraits, but that doesn't matter one single bit. They're every bit as unique, and in fact, they've got more personality than ever. Instead of having a handful of bigger, more traditional boss battles, these ghosts fill that slot. Each one is like a boss battle of sorts, with most feeling like mini-bosses and a handful offering the bigger, more grandiose experiences. The first game used this format as well, but this time each one feels more substantial, whereas before it often came down to figuring out how to open up a non-hostile ghost like a puzzle, this time the encounters are way more action-packed. I will say that a few of these ghosts feel like they're going to be really tough, but then it just comes down to waiting for their attack and hitting them with the strobe bulb at the right time. Would have been nice to have a little more variety with some of the battles, but plenty more of them are really interesting and fun, and the overall character variety makes each one a blast to hunt down and capture. They're at their best when they require that you use your various tools, like Guiji in the suction shot. So far, this review has been, for lack of a better word, glowing, and by now it's probably apparent that I love Luigi's Mansion 3 a whole lot. But now it's time for the less than glowy stuff, and while going in, I was hoping for a few niggling little annoyances at the worst, some of these issues are of an unfortunately serious nature. Probably the most serious issue is that while the whole ghost capturing system is a ton of fun, the individual battles often leave something to be desired. As I said, I absolutely love what the slam mechanic adds to the gameplay, but the fact that you can slam ghosts into other ghosts and stun them frequently makes combat much too easy. Unless you're surrounded by a really large group, it's extremely easy to incapacitate all surrounding ghosts, and when you stun a ghost, you can then suck them up without flashing them, so you can just chain all the ghosts together without any trouble. I would say that about two-thirds of the way through the game is when combat really starts to become interesting, and that's just because the game starts throwing larger and larger groups of ghosts at you. For most of the game, though, encounters, while still fun in their own way, do start to feel a little too samey and repetitive. They're so easy that mopping the floor with a room full of ghosts is something you just sort of do automatically and move on. I frequently posit that ease of gameplay can be offset by variety, but unfortunately in this case there are very few different types of ghosts to fight, and most of them are more or less just returns from Dark Moon. Enemy AI is also not great, with far too many ghosts giving you big fat openings to flash them when they really shouldn't. Sometimes you'll fail to catch a ghost or otherwise screw up in some way, and the ghosts will start to move away, as though you need to hunt them down and try again, but they do so so slowly that it's all too easy to just flash them a second time and finish the job. Sometimes they act like they want to be caught, and between that and the slam ability, there just isn't much challenge or variety. I am always dismayed to play yet another Nintendo game that could be made significantly more fun with a simple hard mode that does not exist. Make fewer hearts spawn, make ghosts deal more damage, done. If you want to get fancy, increase the number of ghosts in each encounter to cut down on the stun issue. Easy, simple, fixes everything. But of course, there's no such mode here, and that fact is positively baffling. Unlike the previous games, clearing a room of ghosts will not permanently turn the lights on, thus ensuring that you're safe when you return later. I do enjoy the feeling of clearing a room and knowing that for the most part it's going to stay clear, but this does add some slight tension when retreading old ground that I do enjoy. You never know when or where ghosts are going to pop up. Especially near the end of the game, you'll come upon gigantic groups of ghosts, and these encounters can be really tricky. The first time I found one of these, I was ecstatic to finally really test my ghost fighting skills. I fought valiantly, but there were so many ghosts, and I had been so ill-prepared for actual challenging combat that they actually bested me. I hit continue and ran back to the spot, fired up and ready to take them on again, reveling in the new challenge I had discovered. And when I got there, they were gone. They just didn't respawn. So I got to thinking, okay, maybe these encounters are somewhat rare, and maybe they give me loads of treasure if I can beat them, like optional challenge battles. So the next time I found one of these gigantic groups, I managed to capture them all, and there was no reward at all. 
they didn't even really give me any extra treasure while I fought them. So basically, some of the only truly challenging fights in the game offer no reward and also don't even let you try multiple times easily. They're just sort of there, and they just sort of don't do anything. And even besides these larger encounters, smaller encounters in areas you've already explored also don't offer much in the way of rewards. These ghosts rarely drop any money. Sometimes they don't even box you in and force you to fight them, so you just sort of run away. Don't get me wrong, it would be annoying if small, insignificant encounters force you to engage, but I also lament the overall worthlessness of a group of ghosts popping up for no reason and you just running past them as though they weren't there. Another big issue with the game, meticulously combing through every room looking for money is a ton of fun. I don't know why, but it's pure zen. Dark Moon let you purchase Poltergust upgrades with your cash, so I was expecting something similar here. Unfortunately, EGAD does eventually open up a shop for you, but there's no such upgrade system. You can only buy three things. There's the Golden Bone, which gives you a continue if you lose all your hearts. The game is already too easy, so that's not something I'll ever touch. Then you can pay to put the location of a boo on your map. And seeing as it's already fairly easy to track them down using the rumble function, not to mention decently fun, that's also worthless. The one semi-helpful thing is putting the location of a random gem on your map. Instead of telling you exactly where one is, it just gives you the room or general area, so it eliminates the need to meticulously search and research every corner of every room while not defeating the point of hunting for gems entirely. This is okay, but it ain't much and it certainly doesn't break the bank or anything. Really, at the end of the day, money is only good for securing a rank after you beat the game. That's it. I mean, I get that the first game was like that as well, but that game was short enough for lots of repeat playthroughs. And Dark Moon started to really go somewhere with the whole money thing. Not only is the rank the only thing you get, the game doesn't even tally up all your individual totals like the other two games did. No stats, no score, no nothing. I got to the end of the game and it was just like, hey, and I'm like, is that it? Is, is, is there an S? I, I don't... Even just giving us our totals on a nice little clear screen for bragging rights would have made a world of difference. But instead, it's just... A. Collecting cash may be one of the best parts of the game, but it loses its glamour when you realize it just doesn't accomplish much, and that's an absolute shame. Also, when I looked up the number needed for the highest rank, I saw that I was so far above the minimum that I didn't need to be half as meticulous in my money collection. It was fun to be meticulous when I thought I was working toward a high score of sorts, but my hard work just didn't pay off. In the future, I know that I can grab that high rank without worrying about nabbing every single stray coin. Another Another crummy thing is that the game doesn't tell you your rank will be based on your current money amount and not the total you've collected. It's not a problem for me, but a less experienced player could essentially ruin their chances of getting a good rank by purchasing stuff. The game verbally encourages you to collect a bunch of money, then offers you stuff to buy with it, then punishes you for buying that stuff. The idea of these shortcut items lowering your score makes perfect sense, but only if we actually know about it, so we can consider that as we play. After the credits, its role, it's disappointing to learn that there's no end game to speak of. If you collected all the boos and gems before you fought the final boss and you put a little effort into picking up cash, you're done. We're certainly not owed a new game plus or a harder mode unlock or post game missions or any of that, but the money and ranking system are enough of a letdown that the absence of that kind of content is felt all the stronger. Maybe I'm spoiled on modern games and I should simply be happy with playing a game up to the credits, but it just feels like a tiny bit of effort in this department would have gone a long way. Final thoughts before we wrap this up. First, I'd like to talk about the online. It works. It's great. I have absolutely no idea why, but in my admittedly short time with Scarescraper, I've experienced zero input lag, disconnects, or major stutters. It's a perfectly serviceable online experience. So, hey! There you go! Luigi's Mansion 3 just became Nintendo's new standard for quality online multiplayer. <laughs> Congratulations! Scarescraper itself is pretty cool. It's randomly generated and you work with other players to capture all the ghosts or take out all the crows or find all the toads or whatever. I never played the Scarescraper in Dark Moon, so multiplayer Luigi's Mansion is a pretty novel concept to me. I haven't played locally yet, but I can imagine it's pretty darn fun and I can see myself getting pretty into it if I ever get a chance. Each Switch can host two players and you and your friends 
friend can either jump online or hook up to other switches. There's a lot of potential there, even if you can only choose between tackling 5 floors or 10 floors and there doesn't seem to be any other reward system or higher difficulty modes from what I've seen, so it doesn't seem to be as fleshed out as something like Splatoon 2's Salmon Run, but still a decently fun time. When I seriously enjoy a game's basic gameplay, I always appreciate when there's some kind of arcade mode that I can essentially play forever. That's why I put so many hours into raid mode in the Resident Evil Revelation games, and why I long for a Pikmin game with some sort of level editor. So it's pretty disappointing that I'm so close to having what I want with Luigi's Mansion, but it's not quite there for me. You can indeed play Scare Scraper solo, but I've found it to be nothing but an exercise in frustration. It doesn't scale down properly for one person, so it's this desperate, frantic race to find what you're looking for, and it's extremely difficult to make it very far. As I've probably said many times by now, I just hate time challenges and would rather have a challenge that's just challenging. <laughs> So unless I'm playing with other people, Scare Scraper just doesn't do it for me. And that's a real bummer, because it has the potential to offer me the more challenging encounters that I find the main game is lacking. Scream Park? I haven't tried. I guess I'm just not that interested. Maybe if I ever get some friends together for Scare Scraper, we'll give Scream Park a try, but... Eh, mini games aren't really my thing, especially if I have to pay 10 extra bucks to get them all. It wasn't gonna affect my score one way or the other though, so I guess it doesn't matter. One thing I haven't talked about yet is Luigi's Mansion 3's sound design. As is the case with the visual design, it's positively fantastic. It's perfect, in fact. The music is all suitably atmospheric with a myriad of different themes, but it's the sound effects that really impress me. You have to play with headphones to really get a feel for how excellent the game sounds. Nintendo has always impressed with their sound effects, but here they're so exceptionally subtle and satisfying. If you listen closely enough, there are even ambient building noises like you would hear in a real hotel. This all works wonders for the immersion factor, and combined with the visuals, completes a picture of absolute perfection. It all adds up into one of the smoothest audio-visual experiences I've had in a video game. Finally, the story doesn't quite live up to its potential, and it's a little disappointing. Like I said, the cutscenes and everything are terrific, and the finale is top notch. It just feels like in the beginning, it's setting up a pretty interesting story, and almost immediately you learn that no, it's basically just as straightforward as ever. It plays all its cards way too early. It's another thing that feels like it could have been drastically improved with just some tiny changes. It's absolutely not a huge deal. Who plays in certain Nintendo series for the story, yada yada yada. It's more just a slight personal disappointment. Luigi's Mansion 3 has some issues. More than I expected, and certainly more than I'm happy with. Many of these issues feel like blunders from a design perspective, and some are a matter of wasted potential. When you love a series so much, and it takes so long to get new entries, you want each one to be everything it can be. Luigi's Mansion 3 is not everything it can be, and yeah, it's frustrating. But man, oh man, that is not enough to ruin the game by any stretch. It still manages to be an experience of unusual quality. The visuals put other Switch games to shame. The wealth of charming little details puts other games <laughs> to shame. In an industry where we all too often see games rush to market to meet deadlines or otherwise just not given a lot of effort in order to cut down on costs, I could show some examples in the B-roll, but now's not the time to start arguments. It's amazing to see a product like this. Rarely have I played a game that feels so full of genuine love. It looks and feels so good, and it's so stuffed with charm that even its most basic moments are a joy. Like Mario Odyssey and Breath of the Wild, it joins the ranks of my personal video game happy places on Switch. And like both previous Luigi's Mansion games, I know I'll be happily playing it for years to come. Despite its flaws, I can't deny how madly in love I am with it, so somehow I still find myself wanting to give it a perfect score. Does it deserve a 6? Am I letting my fanboyism cloud my judgment? I don't know! Who cares? I love this game to pieces, so I'm giving it a 7 out of 7. You can't stop me! Well, there you have it, my friends. Have you been a fan of this series going on 20 years like I have? And does the game live up to your hopes and dreams? Or are you a newcomer to Luigi's weird kind of alternate Mario world? And has it been everything it's cracked up to be? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you for watching. And before you go, little known fact, this is the exact end of the video. <laughs>